Thank you, Nora and Sandra. If you have your Bibles today, would you turn to the book of Acts? We're moving on through this study, the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul and his company. And we're moving to Acts chapter 19 today. We're going to read the first 10 verses there in just a moment. You know, William Franklin Graham Jr., also known as Billy Graham, uh, was born November 7th, 1918, just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. He was raised on a dairy farm, and his dad was a real hard and strict man. In fact, in the year 1933, when Prohibition ended, Graham's dad decided that he would teach him a lesson. And so he took him out, I believe, around the house there and gave him so much beer it made him sick. And Billy Graham said from that point forward, he had an aversion to alcohol, never drank another drop uh, in his life. A year after that encounter with his dad, Billy Graham was attending an evangelistic crusade by the famous evangelist Mordecai Ham. And at that particular crusade, Billy Graham accepted Christ again at the age of 16 as his personal Lord and Savior. Billy Graham was blessed to have so many influential Christians uh, impacting his life, not the least of which was Miss Henrietta Mears, who had a tremendous ministry to Billy Graham while he was attending Wheaton College. Time passed and Billy Graham came to be known as the greatest evangelist of the 20th century. His first evangelistic crusade in 1947 was attended by 6,000 people. And by the time Billy Graham had completed his ministry here on earth, he had preached to an estimated uh, 210 million people in person, not counting over the radio and television. He had preached 400 crusades in 185 cities, and he died at the age of 99. And in my humble opinion, the greatest evangelist of all time. You know, I was thinking about Billy Graham this week, and it's very humbling because I want you to think about this with me. You and I have everything needed to share the gospel that Billy Graham had. We're standing on the same ground. We have the same Bible. We have the gospel message. Those of us who are Christians, we have the Holy Spirit. In the Sunday school lesson today, we were given the same great commission in Matthew chapter 28. And it's humbling to think that this man who accomplished so much was given really nothing more than we've been giving. And so the question is, does that mean that you and I are going to preach to over 200 million people in 185 cities? I don't think so, nor do I think we need to. But I do know this. We're called to carry the gospel message in whatever circle we find ourselves. Paul did that in each of his missionary journeys. He shared in homes we've seen in the past months, and he shared in prisons. He shared to large groups, and he shared to small groups. He witnessed to prominent people, and he witnessed to everyday people. And he, like Billy Graham, is an example to us. With that in mind, look with me at Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 1 today through verse 10. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Into what then were you baptized, he asked them. Into John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. Now there were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months, arguing and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became hardened and would not believe, slandering the way in front of the crowd, he withdrew from them, taking the disciples and conduct, conducted discussions every day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. 
This went on for two years so that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we look at the example of Paul today, would it be that we would be effective bearers of the gospel? Father, you've given us not a great suggestion, not a great recommendation, but a great commission. And we confess to you that all too often, we don't do what you have called us to do in this sin of omission of not sharing the gospel with others through a word of witness, through prayer, through a clear presentation of the gospel. And so as we study Paul's journey here in Ephesus as he begins it, open our eyes to the truth today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now again this morning we see that Paul is in his third missionary journey. And verse 1 tells us that Apollos, who had formerly been in uh, Ephesus, moved on uh, to Corinth. We saw last week that he was commended by the believers in Ephesus, and so he followed God into that particular territory. However, Paul followed Apollos with a ministry in Ephesus. And there we see that Paul met some individuals who needed some more information. They needed the gospel shared with them more accurately. We see also that he met individuals who opposed the gospel. We'll see this morning uh, what he did in regard to that. But more than anything, we see that he did what Billy Graham did and what you and I are called to do, and that is share Jesus Christ. And so today we look at Paul's beginning of ministry here in Ephesus on the third journey as he is uh, back in this area. And I want to note four things that are essential if someone is to effectively share the gospel. These four things need to be true if someone is to be a bearer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I almost hesitate to use the word effectiveness, but if we're to be effective in the work. You know, a lot of times when we look at effective and we say, well, Billy Graham was effective. He, he preached to 200 million plus people in person. Uh, millions of people trusted Christ. And, and we began to attribute effectiveness or success based on people's response. But that's far from the truth. Effectiveness has to do with obedience. In fact, we shared in Sunday school today, many times it takes about seven personal contacts someone must have with a Christian before he or she would accept Christ. Well, what about the second person? There's still a number of people to follow. Is that person a failure if at that moment someone does not accept Christ? No, that person is a success if he or she shares Christ. And that's what Paul did here. You know, uh, my favorite preacher, Dr. Adrian Rogers, who passed in 2007, you can still hear on the radio and can still see on TV today, brought out a great truth. He said, I can preach truth, but it is the Holy Spirit who imparts truth. Do you realize you can speak truth, you can witness to truth, but it is the Holy Spirit who convicts the heart. You know, all of us, we want to be good at what we do. In fact, most of us, if we were honest, we want to be the best at what we do. But I want to appeal to you today that it should be our desire that we be great communicators of the gospel, that we be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others with confidence. And so today, I want to look at these four things. Each of these is true in our text today. We found them in the text. Each is true <clears throat> about the Apostle Paul. And the first thing, an integral thing, is this. Paul communicated completely and correctly the gospel of Jesus Christ. He communicated it completely and correctly. You know, if we are to be effective bearers of the gospel, we must share an accurate message, shouldn't we? In fact, Paul writes in Galatians 1.8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is different from what we have preached, a curse be on him. You see, the point is this, the wrong message, even if it is preached or communicated with great fervor and great conviction, is still the wrong message. There is one complete and one correct gospel, and it centers on the person of Jesus Christ. I wonder today, do you know Jesus Christ? He is the most important person to know, and I hope before you leave today, if you've never done so, that you would trust in him. Well, Paul 
he arrived in Ephesus only to find that the believers there were deficient in their knowledge of the gospel. They knew some elements of the gospel, but they did not know the entire gospel. And because they did not know the complete gospel, they did not know the correct gospel. Last week, we looked at Apollos. Apollos was a brilliant man who had studied in Alexandria. He was preaching, but his message at the point before before he met Aquila and Priscilla was not complete. And you remember last week, Aquila and Priscilla drew him aside, not to embarrass him in public, and taught the gospel more completely to Apollos. And so Apollos was able to go, as we see in verse 1 today, into another territory and share the complete gospel. Yet we see here that Paul is following Apollos in Ephesus. And it's a, not a stretch to, to believe that these people that Paul approached had been under the former Apollos' message, which they received a message, uh, they said very clear, and that it was a message that did not have mentioned the Holy Spirit. In fact, when Paul asked them, they said, we have not even heard of the Holy Spirit. They also stated that their baptism was the baptism of John. So John's baptism was basically this. He was a forerunner. And his message was this, repent. Just as a forerunner would do uh, for a great statesman, uh, that forerunner would go ahead and prepare the way for the one who would follow. And so John the Baptist was saying, repent and prepare the way. And so it was not only repentance we see, but the second aspect, repent and prepare. But the problem was, when Paul came to these people at Ephesus, they had not received the news the Messiah had already come. It was just like in the Civil War. There were points way out in the West, well after April 9th, 1865, they were still battling. They were still in skirmishes. They had not heard that the war had been settled. And so we see here that these disciples uh, were disciples of John the Baptist. They had, in all likelihood, followed Apollos. They they did not have the complete message. They had the repentance right, but they were saying, repent and prepare. And basically, Paul is saying, you don't need to prepare anymore. Jesus has come. And so he shared Jesus with them. And verse 5 tells us that they were baptized. Do you realize we have a spiritual responsibility to share the unadulterated, that is the complete and un hindered gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul says before he leaves Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, he, he, he says a, shares a testimonial with the people there. He says, I did not hold back in sharing with you the whole counsel of God. You know, there are people today who are communicating what we would call a not correct gospel, and I would put quotes around that. There are people today who are trying to communicate a social gospel. They say the problem and the root of the problem is society. If we can fix society, then we will have uh, this euphoric state that we'll be right. Well, the problem is societies are made up of individuals, and the root of sin is in the heart of the individual. And so while the social gospel may communicate something, it is not the complete and accurate gospel. Jesus came to change hearts. And when hearts are changed, and when Jesus is on the throne and individuals, and then society will change. There, there's also the gospel of the atonement uh, and by gospel, I use that word with quotes around it, uh, of example or moral influence. Uh, so Sinus, I believe, is how his name was pres uh, 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 pronounced back in the 16th century, uh, basically said this, that the impact of the gospel of Jesus Christ was that Jesus set uh, a moral example. He was Pelagianist in his thought, which meant his belief was man was basically good, and all we have to do is convince man to get himself on the right track, and if he'll be like Jesus and follow Jesus' example, then he'll be okay. Well, the problem with that is that wrong gospel is focused on man, not God. Jesus came to appease the wrath of the Father. He came to take the penalty of our sin, not to try to conform us in our own way. 
Then there's the truncated gospel that we see here where repentance is preached, but Jesus is not. There are a lot of people that will preach a moral message today, but they won't preach Jesus Christ. We need to be preaching Jesus Christ. Then there's the gospel plus. We just looked in Galatians at the very beginning in chapter 1 and verse 8. And, 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 and Paul said, don't preach any other gospel than what I have preached, what we have preached to you. If you've done so, let yourself be accursed. Well, what was that gospel that was not the true gospel? They were saying, yeah, believe in Jesus, but you know what? You must add circumcision. You must add the law. And so what they were communicating was faith in Christ was not alone. That was an inaccurate gospel. And we are called as Christians to communicate the true gospel. And listen, it's very simple. Man has sinned. You have sinned. Repent of your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe. And that's what Paul preached. And then they were baptized. You say, well, did they need to be baptized again? In this case, they did because their first baptism was not with a complete understanding of the gospel. But now they understood it. Now, there's an aside that I must address while we're here before we move to the second aspect. But the first aspect, again, we must communicate correctly and completely the gospel. But the aside that I want to address is found in verse 6. It says, And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues. Some people would argue, and I would vehemently say wrongly, that this is the norm for all believers. They would say, what happened here? Every believer must have the hands laid on them. Ha great luck finding an apostle to do that. Must have the hands laid on them and must speak in tongues. What well, the very best, speaking in tongues is a gift, not a requirement uh, for salvation. But some people would say uh, that you must do this. And they would say, it's prescribed. Well, this is a narrative. This is describing what happened. In fact, the rest of the scripture tells us the New Testament shows us this isn't the norm. I like what John R.W. Stott says in the tiny book, Baptism in Fullness. I think I'm on my third copy that I've had since college because the binders keep breaking on them because it's such a good book on this issue. And, and in that book, that tiny book, Baptism in Fullness, he spoke of two times in the book of Acts where the laying on of hands of the apostles and speaking in tongues occurred. The first is found not here in Acts 19, but in Acts chapter 8. Samaritan believers had trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles went there to find out what was going on when they saw that these Samaritans who were not true Jews had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They laid their hands on them and they began to speak in tongues. Stott argues, and I believe so clearly and accurately, that this was not the norm. The gospel was moving to a new people and the, the Samaritans needed to see visibly, yes, we can be a part of the kingdom. The Jews who were there, they needed to see, yes, the Samaritans can believe. And so what he is arguing here, and I would agree that this isn't normative. This was a special event where God was doing a great work. Now, as we look in Acts chapter 19 in our text, these 12 here, a lot of people will say, well, they were already believers. Well, no, they had just heard John's baptism. They had not heard the full gospel. They would say, this is a second blessing. The hands were laid on them and they began to speak in tongues. Well, that's not the case at all. They weren't Christians. They accepted Christ and then the hands were laid on them and they spoke in tongues. Do you realize as a Christian, you don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit. When you trust Christ, you have as much of the Holy Spirit, you have as much of him as you want. Romans chapter 8, verses 9. You know what? Rather than look at narratives and try to draw conclusions, I like the direct teachings and like to interpret it. And, and the scripture tells us in Romans 8, 9, if anyone does not have the spirit of God, he or she does not belong to Christ. So it's not a time where you're waiting. The scripture says, if you don't have the spirit of God, you don't even belong to Christ. And so we see here that that's the case. Well, you say, well, I don't understand. Why is that? Why are these two occurrences? Why are they expressed? 
Let me explain it to you this way, and it's a way I understand it may help you or may not. This is an, an inceptive age of the church here in Acts. Things are just beginning. If you and I were to own a business and, and we were to uh, have a grand opening, we might say, buy one donut and get two donuts free. But then a year later, someone comes and we still have donuts, we still sell them, and they say, I want my one donut and two free. And we say, what? That was a grand opening. That happened in the inception. That happened. You can still buy the donuts, but it's not the same. These two activities were happening in the early church, and they happened specifically to a reason, but they're not normative throughout the rest of Christianity. And I'll leave it at that. Because we'll move on as we look at this study of what we need to do to be effective communicators of the gospel. First, we saw just a few moments ago, Paul communicated clearly and completely the gospel and correctly. But I want you to see, secondly, he preached boldly. Look at verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months. Boldness is a key to effectiveness. You'll say, now, Rick, I'm a shy person. I can't even speak in front of someone. Hang in there. We're going to show that it's not about you. It's not about me. But boldness is key. You know, have you ever traveled with someone and they've not been bold with the directions? You don't have a GPS. And they're thinking, well, I think it might be this road. I think it could be, though, on maybe a mile more up the road. And you're just shaking your head and saying, where in the world are we going? We cannot effectively communicate the gospel if we don't do so with confidence. We must do it with confidence and boldness. Now, listen, this is key. You may say, I'm a shy person. The Christian's boldness comes from two very concrete things. The first is this, the truth of what someone is sharing. The truth of what I'm sharing. We can have confidence. It has stood the test of time. So we don't need to timidly approach someone, but we can be confident that the message that we have is true. But not just that, and this is important. We have boldness and confidence because of the source and the strength and the authority that lies behind that message. There's an authority. You've heard it said when an officer stands at a busy intersection and holds up his hand to stop, that hand, Johnny will know that, that doesn't stop a car, but the authority behind that hand will stop that car. So when we go out and communicate the gospel, it's not our strength that does it, it's the authority of the gospel itself. It's the authority of the one who sent us, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul entered the synagogue and he boldly spoke. I wonder today, whom has God placed on your heart to share the gospel with? You need to go confidently. Pray. Seek it. Pray that God will lead you. Trust that God, as your authority, is leading you in that endeavor. So he preached the gospel of Jesus boldly. I want you to see a third thing. Not only did he preach it correctly and completely, not only did he preach it boldly, but... Paul preached the gospel of Jesus selectively. And this sounds strange because Jesus came to die for the world. But think about this. When Jesus sent out his disciples, you remember he sent them out. He says, if you come to a house of peace and a person of peace, and they open the door, stay with them, dine with them, stay and minister. But it said, if you come up Cross a home that rejects you. He told them to leave that place and as a sign of leaving, shake the dust off of your feet. Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, do not cast your pearls before swine. In other words, the gospel is for all people. But listen, sometimes it behooves the preacher or the communicator to move on to more receptive people. What was happening here in Ephesus, there was a resistant group in the synagogue and Paul was having a lot of problem. It would be as if I were trying to speak now and a number of people were shouting out, rejecting what I'm saying and distracting people. Paul, I believe, understood it was fruitless to continue in that, so he moved to Tyrannus' hall. So the scripture says he withdrew. He withdrew. 
from them. But we need to be very careful here. Just because someone initially rejects the gospel does not mean that we never return to that person. It does not mean that we give up on them. But there are times when it's clear from the Lord that we have sown the seed that we're supposed to and we can move on. You know, I encourage many people to have a most wanted list. It may be a list of three, of five. For me, it's ten people for whom I pray that don't know the Lord. Some of them I've been praying for over 30 years if not seen the result of it. But I keep them in prayer because the Lord has continued to lead me to pray. And we need to be ready to go to whomever God leads. Paul selectively shared the gospel. He, he chose a different venue. But I want you to see a final truth. Not only did he preach completely and correctly the gospel, we see that. Not only do we see, as in verse 8, that he preached uh, with great fervor. Not only do we see that he preached the gospel boldly, but we see that he preached the gospel of Jesus in varied ways. And by that, I mean in diverse settings and with diverse messages. Listen, the gospel is one message but it can be communicated in so many different ways. We shared that in Sunday school in our class today. A number of ways. Personal testimony. Sometimes over a cup of coffee and a discussion with a friend. Maybe bringing someone to church and having the preacher preach an evangelistic message. There's so many ways. As was consistently true of Paul here in Ephesus. Where did he begin? In the synagogues. But the blessing is he wasn't so scripted that he said, I'm just going to stay there. When, when the opportunity arose, he moved to Tyrannus' hall. So we've seen throughout this entire study that Paul communicated the gospel in a setting before one and before a family. He preached to a crowd, much as I'm doing here. We saw it in Acts chapter 18, verse 5 last week. He, he debated opponents. And then we see here in Tyrannus' hall in verse 8 that he discussed the word. He was in discussion. That's our English word. That Greek word it leads to our English word dialogue. He was sitting down and there was a back and forth discussion. So he preached. He debated. He taught. He discussed. He did it out in the open. He preached in the synagogues. He preached in the jail. He preached in homes. He preached in a hall. He did so to opponents and friends, to the receptive and the unreceptive, to large groups down to the individual. He was ready in each and every system. The question for you today is, are you ready? Do you realize the same Bible that Billy Graham had, the same gospel that Billy Graham had, the same Holy Spirit who indwelled Billy Graham, the same commission that he received has been given to you and me? Does that mean you go to preach before 200 million? If God leads you, so be it. But I can tell you this, you're responsible in your circle. There are two simple things you can do to get ready. I was laughing. Someone said they want to be a world traveler. They want to, I want to go see the world. And this other person said to him, well, you got to get a passport first. You can't even travel the world if you don't get a passport. That's a first simple step. You, you say, well, I want to be an effective communicator of the gospel. Well, there are two simple steps you should do first. One is work on a personal testimony that you can share your life before knowing Christ, how you came to know Christ, and how Christ has made you different. That you should be able to share just like that. Very simple. Everyone has a story. And secondly, learn a simple way to share the gospel. A simple, simple way. There are a number of ways. In October, we're blessed in early October, New Life Global Ministries, I'm on the board there. They are actually coming to do some witness and training for us here. We're going to get out in the community and visit with people and share a simple message that we'll be able to learn in a matter of one to two hours. 
So work on that personal testimony. Know how to share the gospel. Chances are I am not preaching before the next Billy Graham or the next Henrietta Mears today. But I know confidently I am preaching to people who have trusted Christ, who have all they need to be able to share the gospel. You have the complete message. You know Christ. You have the authority behind you, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, to lead you to speak boldly. You have the various avenues in which to share. There are so many avenues today in the example of various ways that Paul shared that example that you can do. Let's get to it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Paul, who was an example to us, who shared the complete gospel and did it boldly and was able to adapt and was able to do it in various ways. Father, you call us simply to tell others of you. Father, help us to develop that personal testimony. And if we're not comfortable, help us to ask someone who will help us to develop that. Lord, help us to understand how clearly to tell people how they can be saved. Father, what a blessing it is to be able to, to carry the message of the gospel to others.